My name is Jean Boreen. I am the Dean of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and I am very pleased this morning to have the opportunity to introduce Ryan Paul and Wyatt Eiler to you as we prepare ourselves to hear about the secrets of Cedar City. As an English professor who loves history, I relish opportunities to hear background information on places I visit, but probably love even more getting to know about the places I live. And as someone who has only lived in Cedar City a few years, I'm especially excited to hear what Ryan and Wyatt have to share with us this morning. Ryan Paul is a lecturer of history at Southern Utah University, and I suspect there are some of you out here in the audience who have had Ryan for a class and know, as I do, how fabulous he is. Previous to his time at SUU, Paul was the museum director for the Frontier Homestead State Park here in Cedar City. Ryan is the author of Celebrate 50 Years, Utah Shakespeare Festival, and the book Sing Away, which is about the Utah Parks Company. He has written five documentary films, lectured across the state as a Utah Humanities Council Rhodes Scholar, uh, served as president of the Utah Museums Association, and created a number of museum exhibits. Paul Ryan earned a bachelor's degree in history from Weber State University, and we won't hold that against him, a master's degree in history from the University of Mississippi, and a master's degree in arts administration from Southern Utah University. Raised in Centerville, Utah, Wyatt Eiler now considers Cedar City home. A graduate of SUU, Wyatt sampled a variety of majors before finally committing to English, a very wise decision indeed. He has worked in the world of online education as an editor, writer, presenter, director, and producer. Recently, his path took an unanticipated turn to tourism. The past 18 months have been a whirlwind of video and photographic activity as Wyatt became reacquainted to the beautiful place he calls home. As an aspiring gardener, landscape and construction enthusiast, fire barrel carver and stargazer, Wyatt continues to experience life as it unfolds each day, viewing the beauties of the world through his ever-present camera. Sharing research from their YouTube series, Main Street Minutes, I give you Ryan Paul and Wyatt Eiler. All right, all right, all right, huh? <laughs> Exactly, and I love it. Well, this is gonna be such a fun hour. I am so happy to be here. Thank you guys so much for being here um, and sharing all about this. I feel like I'm opening a, a treasure trove, like a treasure chest of information, and I can't wait to get into it. Excellent. But the first thing I thought I'd do is see just kind of a show of hands, and hello to everybody watching online also. How many here have lived in Cedar all their life? A few. How many have lived in Cedar City for more than 20 years? How many have lived in Cedar City for 10 years or more? How about five years or more? How about two years or more? And how about this is your first year in Cedar? Whoa! <laughs> that's like the biggest group. So this is going to be so cool. So we thought this would be just such a fun event to kind of dig into, you know, our town and learn about our town. But I first want to just kind of give a little bit of a background of what we're looking at on stage. Um, we've got some great uh, additional stories. One of them we're going to tell today and then a couple of additional stories. So um, Wyatt, maybe can you tell us where did these come from and what, what, are, what are these representations? that we're looking at. Absolutely. So we, uh, at the tourism office, for, we were part of the Utah uh, Rural Summit, which was hosted here at SUU just a week or so ago. And part of the thing, that the, the theme was resilience. And so that was the, some of these stories that Ryan and I have been able to tell through um, the Main Street Minutes project. Uh, we got to do some panels about them. So the Bank of Southern Utah, that is one of the stories that we'll actually be showing uh, here today. Uh, the Canaraville All Women Fire Department, that's a teaser for things that are coming. And then over here on my left is the, uh, the Livestock Co-ops uh, and uh, Helen Foster Snow. And both of those are stories that we uh, have told as well. And we'll be talking more about those during the podcast. Yes, that's right. You guys are going to join me for the radio show mm -hmm. at 3 p.m. today. So if you want to hear more, KSUU 
Thunder 91.1 at 3 p.m. and that'll turn into our podcast. One also housekeeping bit, we know we have a lot of students and we know that part of some of your assignments is to get a photo. Um, and so we will definitely be hanging around on stage for a little bit after the event so you can get those much needed points. Um, and for anybody else who wants to come and check out what the panels have to say on them. Okay, so I'm gonna start off off topic because when we were doing our sound check, you were telling me we, were, we got into talking about music because Wyatt is a musician, I'm a musician, and you started telling us how music saved Southern Utah University in a way and saved the school. And that's kind of a secret. I want to know that secret. Would you share that story with us? Absolutely. And you should know that my graduate work was on the history of rock and roll. Oh, and so we're all My whole thesis was on Elvis and Johnny Cash and awesome. Carl Perkins and all that cool stuff. So if you look, I actually brought my... Can we get in my pocket? Got it, How man. exciting. It's more anticlimactic. We're gonna uh, is my laser pointer here. So this guy right here, can you see him? With the violin. With the violin is uh, Dr. Halverson. He was a early, well, early in the 1920s, music person. He traveled. He was inspired. Lots of people. He's one of the creditors that started the, the Community Messiah that we do every year. I, I don't know about this year, but we do most often every year the community involved. And, and back then, the university and the school was really part of, was the center of the community, really. So at the time in the 1930s, the, the regents and the legislature were looking to cut funds. And one of the places they were absolutely going to cut was, well, not SU at the time, but, but this institution. They yeah. just saw it as, as more rural and, and not as, as critical to the, the more needs of the Wasatch Front. So they came down, they visited, they, uh, they were making their report, and it was, we know, to be fairly, we have to make hard choices. Right. right. And Halvers, uh, Dr. Halverson and, other, and others knew this was happening, so we arranged a performance of the Messiah that involved the university and involved the community and uh, agreed to let these legislators and regents come and sit. And they purposefully asked for chairs in the back of the room by the door so they could leave when it was, before it was over, right? Because, you know... Yeah. You know. Yeah. So you never know what you're going to get with community theater. So anyway, they're sitting there uh, and they're ready to leave, and the music starts, and they're so overwhelmed that they're captivated and they stay. And they credit them themselves going back to Salt Lake saying, We need to save this institution because of people like that and because of what they're doing. Wow. So, that music is wins. Music, music wins, wins and SUU wins. I mean, we're here today perhaps because of that performance and that is a great story. I didn't know that story and I'm really happy to hear it. And the Messiah is happening this year, I, I do know. Oh, very uh, cool. So that's great, so anybody who's interested. And it is a combination, it's a community production. We have stu students in it, um, a lot of members of our music department. So that's just a great little starting story. Well, thank you for sharing that. But we're here to talk about your guys' work together and I'd love for you to give us a little bit of background of how the relationship between you two began, the collaboration between you two began, and maybe just talk about what, what is Main Street Minutes? How did it start? What, what's the deal? I'm glad you asked that, because look at Wyatt. I've admired him for years. How could you not? <laughs> I mean, you know. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> so, well, actually, Ryan and I were just talking about this, because I, I, I said to my wife last night, I, I'm trying to remember exactly when Ryan and I met. And you know, we, so we were talking about it beforehand, and you know, when did we meet, and why did this, how did this start? Well, actually, it's our, it's our wives that uh, are the reasons that, that Ryan and I that, uh, met. Both worked at the, uh, or continued to work at the Utah Shakespeare Festival, and, and through events that they hosted, that's how Ryan and I, uh, our relationship started. And this friendship grew into, into finding ways to spend time with one another. And because we're both pretty busy guys, it came down to Ryan saying, hey, I've got this project over here at the Frontier Homestead. What do you think? And I'm like, cool. I've never done that. Let me try it. And so I started volunteering at the Frontier Homestead. Uh, great opportunity to volunteer with my son as well. And so we did a lot of that kind of thing. And then uh, I was working for another company. Ryan was working for the for Frontier Homestead. And uh, he said, hey, I've got this idea. Will you come over and talk with uh, Maria Twitchell, the director of the Tourism uh, Bureau, here at, uh, we've got this project we want to, want to talk to you about. And so they pitched the idea of Main Street Minutes. And Ryan said, you know, it's just a historical series about uh, things that happened here in, in Southern Utah, in Cedar City, and the Iron County as a whole. And 
totally intrigued by the idea. I thought it was great. And so I kind of laid out, you know, here's what it would cost for me to be able to do it. Here's a, those types, types of things. And nothing happened. <laughs> um, and as Ryan likes to say, it actually took a change of career for both of us for this uh, project to actually uh, come to fruition. Uh. And so uh, Ryan moved from Frontier Homestead to SUU full time. And I moved from my previous career to the uh, to visit Cedar City Brian Head and finally had an opportunity to put the project together. You know, it's, it's interesting how, I, if you, you, looking back, you see how all these little intersections yeah. fit, and that's what's amazing about the study of history, right, is that, that you, we often say that the gates of history swing on small hinges, that these yeah. little events, you know, you end up here and you make decisions that, that lead the course of your life in one or another. And I remember the first, uh, before I took the job at Frontier Homestead back in, uh, eons ago. Uh, the first book I ever picked up was The History of Iron County by Janet Segmiller. Oh. Who, who, and that's what I want to get to, is that what we're doing is really the, the culmination of the work of many, many, in my Absolutely. mind, probably more brilliant Absolutely. people. And, and we're just sitting on the, the, the backs of these people who have done amazing work in scholarship, in, uh, in pitching our community, Maria and others, who have just really created an environment to let us tell these amazing stories in a way that just wasn't available to us before. Is this something that you've done before in any of the other places that you've lived? Um, you know, really get into the history of the place or is that is this new to you here? No, I made a very conscious decision. Well, I went to, to Ole Miss specifically to study Southern culture and, and, and rock and roll, as I said. I was fascinated by what that means as a larger format. And uh, I made a very conscious decision after finishing Ole Miss before I moved on to a PhD program, I, I had an opportunity to do that, but I felt very committed to public history. Mm -hmm. I thought that's what I wanted to do. Um, I remember very clearly the moment I decided that I want to be a historian, and it came, is this off track? Should no, I tell on? me, I want to uh, know. <laughs> it, it, it came with a photograph of the dedication of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh -huh. And I remember seeing that, and I, and I had this thought that once that flash bulb or flash powder or whatever went off, that each of those people left to their homes. Right. And each one of those people had people that loved them, had people that hated them, had friends, had enemies, had wants and dreams and wishes. And I just thought, I think the Brooklyn Bridge is cool, yeah. but those, those stories are amazing to think about, right? That, that those human experiences transformed me. And I thought, what better way to spend a life than to tell the stories of other people. I love and, it. And I think that's kind of where we, we've talked mm -hmm. about this idea of, of always want, and so it's not just, I'm rambling, about stories, but it's about object-based storytelling. That's how museum artifacts come in, and, and, you, and buildings, as we'll talk about. So I think it's, it's a passion to connect people to the environment in which they live. Place, in my mind, is absolutely critical to who we are. It's a wonderful thread. Last week we were talking about the Amachi camp in Colorado and the history and the storytelling associated with that and a historical time and place. And now we're talking about our own city. So it's a great through line. Um, so Main Street Minutes is completed its first season. Is that right? Correct. And how many are in the series? Where can people find it? Let's get into the nitty gritty of that. So the easiest place to find it is, is um, and I'm going to say the YouTubes because that's just the way I say it. <laughs> uh, either on YouTube or on Facebook at Visit Cedar City. Uh, that's the, uh, Visit Cedar City is the, the channel where we've got and there is a playlist of all the Main Street Minutes and I think we've got how many for this first season? And nine? now I, I think there's nine. nine. Um, and so there's the stories that we'll be sharing today as well as some additional ones. And uh, those stories, and, it, and you know, it's interesting, you know, Ryan talks about he's, he, you know, the, developed this interest. Well, for me, I'm looking at it from a slightly different perspective. So when I joined the, the, the Tourism Bureau, um, one of the things that I was asked in my interview, you know, was well, what, what do you want to do? You know, what would be one of the purposes for you? Why do you want this job? And I said, well, I, I want to get to know the places that are here. Yeah. You know, I want to experience this town in which I have determined to settle. And um, this, is, this is going to be my place. And so uh, what I didn't realize, though, is that I would kind of get hooked. Uh. And uh, the, that element of discovery that shows up when you start to put together a project like this. Uh, Ryan exposed me to the uh, Utah Digital Newspaper Archive. And by the way, if, you're, if you want to go there, awesome, please do. 
but know you'll be there forever. Um, <laughs> and by the way, that's one of the only times in a positive way you'll ever hear the, fr the phrase, Ryan exposed. <laughs> True. But at the same time, so what it, what it did for me is the, the initial pitch for Main Street Minutes was we have these structures in town. You know, we've got the depot, we have, uh, uh, whether it's the Cedars Hotel or the, the former, or the non-existent now, the uh, El Escalante. And we wanted to, you know, identify and highlight these physical places. But once we started putting the series together, it became more about the stories that happened at these places. And, you know, that's, for me, that became the thing that became more interesting to tell, is we've got all these great photos, and, you know, uh, Paula Mitchell with, uh, at the library has been invaluable in, uh, you know, providing a lot of those, that material. Absolutely. Woohoo. Yeah, yeah, Paula's um, here. There she is. Yay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is for you, Paula. That's right. And so it's an opportunity to share these things that we, 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 that, are, that we have in this archive, but to get to tell a story around it. And for me, that's become fascinating. Perfect. And so, you know, I, and like I say, I spent far too much time on the digital newspaper archive. But it leads to these great projects. Does. And let's get into one. Let's like watch our first one. We have three to show. Um, so if we could get that video queued up and going, we'll take a look at our first one, which I think is about the bank. Cedar City's Main Street is full of stories. Join us for one. It's Christmas Eve 1931, and the board of directors at the Bank of Southern Utah have just had some distressing news. Due to the crippling effects of the Great Depression and lower than expected yearly tax deposits, the bank would be unable to meet its state-mandated legal reserves. A difficult decision was made. The 27-year-old bank would close its doors. In February 1904, Nathan T. Porter, the president of the Branch Agricultural College, now Southern Utah University, was convinced that for this community to move beyond its current rural barter and trade economy, a strong financial institution was needed. The Bank of Southern Utah was born. Porter proved to be correct. By making cash money easier to come by, the volume of business increased in Cedar City by 25%. By 1925, the bank had proven a valuable asset to the community and was ready to move into a new building. The bank, along with the local economy, continued to thrive until the economic struggles of the nation forced themselves upon Cedar City and the bank's directors made their challenging Christmas Eve decision. While the state bank commissioner favored liquidation of the bank, it was agreed that if $100,000 could be raised locally, the bank could reopen. Cedar City residents accepted the challenge. Citizens mortgaged their homes, borrowed from insurance policies, and teachers donated their pay, but only $90,000 could be raised. Reluctantly, the bank commissioner agreed that business could resume. On May 4, 1932, the bank reopened. Some feared a run on the bank, and a run there was, but not to withdraw, to deposit. More than $26,000 was deposited that first day, and the community celebrated with a grand ball that night. Cedar City had saved their bank. The Bank of Southern Utah became the only bank in the state that closed and reopened during the Great Depression. Wow, that is so cool, yeah! What a story of resilience and, and community. And I wonder if you could give us a little more background and since then that's what's available online, I imagine that there may be some other backstories or other things you can tell us about that. Yeah, so I think it's important to remember that, uh, well, inter interesting if you bring that up. So in that book that Janet wrote, History of Iron County for the Centennial 1996, the subtitle is Community Above Self. Mm. And I think that's one of the, the messages that we want to Absolutely. portray in all of these stories is that the, the unique nature of this community, not all the time, but many times, really was a collection of individuals who sacrificed their individuality and, and, and their needs and wants 
response for the good of the community. Certainly in the establishment of this school is one, and we have the bank and the Shakespeare Festival and the Rock Church and a lot of other opportunities where many community members said, I'm going to give up something for the greater good. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's really a positive thing to think about. So it's also important to note that, that in Cedar City at the time, well, in, in southern Utah, it was an extremely cash-poor environment, right? I mean, there's just not a lot of cash around. There's no bank, for one. And everything was done through the co-ops. So if you had cash, you would go into the co-op and buy a pair of shoes or whatever. And oftentimes, they didn't have enough money for change. So they would give you a coupon that said, come back, an IOU, come back tomorrow for change. Or come back the next day. And sometimes people would have to go back two or three times to get their change in cash. Um, William R. I keep William R. Palmer tells a story that when he left on his LDS mission, that the majority of the, the the ward had a party for him, and the majority of things that he got were coupons for fifty cents off, a dollar off, a dollar for the co-op. Wow! So you would go to the co-op, and, and and that's how people did that. And what happened was people would actually take their sacks of grain or their eggs or their chickens to the co-op to get those coupons to give to people oh. as cash. And that's how you paid your taxes. That's how you paid your tuition wow. in the same way. You took stuff to the goods to the co-op, got the certificates, and paid it that way. Wow. So, so that's the kind of community in which, in which we lived. And Nathan Porter, who's just right over there, actually, uh, I think he's pointer. the third. Oh, my pointer. On the wall. Yeah, he's the on the wall over the there. Wall. In the, <laughs> I'll get this here, right? Oh, it's, it's, oh, wait, right there. Oh, right there. Oh, right there. Okay. Yeah. He, uh, he's like the third or fourth president. He's the guy that builds the Braithwaite, yeah. the mm -hmm. science building. Now, it was called the Braithwaite now. He's the one who has a friend that, that uh, he knows really well up in Davis County, and there's a little bank there, and he thinks, well, if it can work there, it can work here. So he comes back and says, we got to do this. We have to have a bank for, to move cash. There's no way businesses can grow. The only people getting cash were people who were selling their wool or their livestock. Right. So... It, 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 he, he got another num number of men together. They worked. They struggled to get this. People were finding ways to put the initial investment in to get this bank going. And, and like I said, once it got going, I mean, the, the business, the next year, business increased in Cedar by 25%. Wow. And, and money is just now turning over more and more. And uh, it, it, it improves. I mean, it, it, things go incredibly well. Well, and for the sake of brevity, so we talked about the fact that, you know, the bank commissioner in Salt Lake was reluctant to allow them to reopen. Well, reluctant was just the, the, the one word we put in there to, no, they really didn't want to open the bank. And so, as a, again, going through the digital archive, reading through the news stories at the time, things that were pro that produced locally here, and then reading the stuff from the, from the Salt Lake papers as well, because we made the Salt Lake papers at the time. <laughs> um, but there was, a, there was serious concern about you know, what this could do to this community if this bank reopened and then completely folded. Right. And so the story is is deeper than what we had the time to tell. Yeah. But we you know there's a lot of lot hanging on that word reluctant right there. <laughs> yeah. And it's important to note that the bank was not insolvent. I mean and, and, and if you read if you read the, the paper and you read the, the records that that the bank did close and everyone but they they're all very clear to say it's not that we didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. So the way the the and I'm not an economist, certainly, but the way the, uh, the, the banking laws worked was that you had to have a certain percentage of your deposits in what they called the Federal Reserve. And any time it went below that 15%, you had to close. Mm -hmm. you, that, that was the, the measure of being open. So the Bank of Southern Utah actually had plenty of money in it. It was solvent. But what happened was, because of the Depression, the Iron County Commission said, well, we'll just push your tax date mm -hmm. from November to December. Oh. So now you don't have to pay your taxes till December. So what happens is, is that residents of Cedar City who are using the bank uh, wait till December to pay their taxes and to buy their Christmas presents, which then siphons off that reserve level to just below. And so it's almost a preemptive thing for them to close the bank before it happens. But they're always very clear to say that, that it was always more of a technicality, but, but we did. And they said, the bank commissioner said, you got to have 100,000 bucks to do it. And they can't do it. They can't, I mean, teachers, like I said, donating their pay. Um, they're having little bake sales and fundraisers, and they get close, 90000 Yeah. And the bank commissioner says, you are crazy. 
to open this bank. To have little bake sales to save the bank, I mean, mm -hmm. that just seems amazing. And the fact that they got so close, I mean, that's pretty close. 90,000 yeah. is very close. Uh, mm -hmm. that, that also is fascinating. And then the bank reopens and people are lined up around the block to put their money back in. That's also a really interesting component. Um, what else, did you find anything else surprising about this story or in your, in your process of discovery, did you find anything that was surprising to you? To me, it was the celebration. Um, you know, I mean, when they, we talk, oh, it, it was a party. No, it was a, there were orchestras. Uh, there, they played, and in, in, in fact, it was in the Rock Church. Um, I discovered that, that some of these things took place. There were orchestras, and it wasn't just a, oh, come and hang out for, for an hour or whatnot. This was a, you know, half-day celebration of the fact that the community saved their bank. And so that was, that was, it was great to hear the way that they partied in the 30s. Yeah. <laughs> And it was led by the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce and the bank commissioner who had total control because once once you close, it's the bank commissioner's gig. And and he was very adamant that, that it's much easier to liquidate the bank and open a new one than it is to try to save one like this. And the Chamber of Commerce was the one who rallied the community and led the charge to get the bank loaded, uh, loaded to get the bank uh, saved. But I think the other thing that I was interested about in the early days was that when the Bank of Southern Utah first opened, they were terrified, and not because of a run on the bank as people were going to try to, because there wasn't a bank. It was for change. Yeah. They thought the stores were going to come in and, and use the bank to get all the money out to make change for their customers. So the run they were worried about was all the co-ops and businesses wanting change. Wow. Well, before we go to the next one, I just want to touch briefly on that community, uh, community before self concept. And I just was curious what your opinions are on how that plays out today in modern times and and do you feel that that is still a, a, a vital part of our community? Do you feel that's um, still something to strive for? Is it harder to do now? Just kind of curious about your opinions on that. <laughs> Did I open a can of worms? <laughs> I don't think so. I mean, so for me, um, I think that is one of the defining characteristics of this community um, is this community above self because it more and more stories that I read and the more that I discover. Yeah, like any community, there's, there's disagreement. There's people that won't buy into to certain ideas or ideals. But I think that is simply a foundational component of Cedar City. And so does it happen today? Absolutely. You know, I, I see it in the way that uh, uh, we have community theaters that have, that have popped up and are just ridiculously well supported. And uh, whether we seem to, you know, we, we, are, we are an arts community, uh, but we are also an out outdoor community. Yeah. And the way that uh, people have responded to, um, you know, we've got uh, an incredible series of mountain bike trails that were essentially community uh, right. sponsored in the Iron Hills trail system. And, and that's fantastic. And so those things do happen. Um, I think it's harder to get through some of that noise today. Yeah. Um, but I think in some ways it's easier to grab a following because of how exposed, it's easier to expose those types of things and those ideas um, and communicate broadly. Uh, you know, my social media manager would be uh, upset with me if I didn't, you know, mention the fact that you know that's one of the ways that we are able to get that message out. Yeah. You know, whether it's whether it's a community thing or a tourism thing or whatever it might be. But so no, I, I absolutely believe that uh, that that is very present in, in community. I think it's much easier to self-select though yeah. today as well. I mean, there's certainly if you think about. In, in, even up to, I mean, I-15 I doesn't come to Cedar City till the 70s, right? So I think that that in those rural, when we were more rural than we are now, I think that you are locked into this community of these are the people who you are going to worship with, who you're going to work with, who you're going to, to spend money with and on uh, for everything else. You're going to educate them. You, you have a much closer knit community by geographic design. I think that, that it's, it takes more of an effort now for us to do that because of, of noise and there are more things going on and we have more access to information and we've let, for good or ill, more of the, the, the national or other elements impact us in a way that, that they just didn't have 
back then. I only mention it, not, not to put you on the spot, but it's such a beautiful concept. And, and we hear it in the stories of the university. We're hearing it in the stories of Main Street Minutes. Mm -hmm. And in, in this time of 2020, in, in everything that we've struggled with as a, as a community and as a nation, and, and perhaps will continue as the year comes to a close, that it's just sort of a beautiful reminder of that we have this. We have this sense of community, how lucky we are. So that's just a little bit of that. As we move into our next one, you mentioned the Rock Church. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a perfect segue to get ready to play our next video, um, which is about the church. Cedar City was not spared from the terrible effects of the Great Depression. And when federal funds were offered to build a new post office, the community, after much deliberation, decided that the perfect spot was here, where the much-loved tabernacle stood. However, one local congregation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the First Ward, still met in the old building. Bishop Franklin B. Wood, the ecclesiastical leader of the First Ward, was determined to build a new chapel east of the tabernacle. Once again, these people would place community above self and create a monument to their faith. Local contractor George Wood, who had designed many of the structures at Bryce Canyon and the north rim of the Grand Canyon, was selected as the architect. Wood submitted a Tudor-style design based on the architecture he'd seen during his travels in Europe. Controversially, he argued for the use of local materials in the building's construction. But many locals and church officials had trouble visualizing Wood's design and opposed his plan. However, Wood convinced them that using local materials would save money, and the design was eventually approved. Construction began in earnest as community members sprang into action, not only donating labor, but money as well. Trees from Cedar Canyon were harvested for the roof and interior structure, pews and dais. Local wool was woven into carpets. Granite from nearby quarries was used in the foundations, and iron from county mines was forged in the chandeliers and hinges. Most impressively, Rock from the surrounding hills was collected, sorted by color, and incorporated into the walls. June 15th through 20th, 1931, was proclaimed as Rock Week, and the local newspaper wrote, A great amount of enthusiasm has been worked up, and each man who will be on the job is determined to bring in the most colorful rock to be found. In fact, they are vying with each other that the rock they will deliver will be superior to that anyone else might bring in. The rock was split so that the most colorful pieces could be used. As the rock walls rose, detractors became supporters, and the chapel soon became known as the Rock Church. Fittingly, the old clock from the tabernacle was placed into the steeple of the new church. The building was dedicated on May 27, 1934, by church president Heber J. Grant, and still serves as a functioning chapel. The Rock Church stands as a community landmark and a testament to the resilience and perseverance of the local residents. This is a fun one because there's controversy and competition <laughs> and so much local material. Um, the, the most surprising part to me is that even the wool was used to uh, weave into the rugs. That's amazing. Um, I'd like to know, will you tell us a little more about the controversy or any of the other little stories around this, uh, you know, really uh, extravagant design, you know, and how it came to be? Well, I think that it's important to to write well, yes we I, I we can <laughs> I think that it, what, what's what the stream the, the thing that we find amongst all of these stories many of them really is that the, I think the line we use there is that detractors become supporters and and that's in most everything we we found right I mean when when Fred Adams starts looking for the Shakespeare Festival uh, he gets there's not a lot of people willing to help him out. And then it becomes successful, and then it's like, oh man, this is great. Right. And I think the Rock Church is, is another example, right, that, that we're in the middle of the Depression, and it's a whole other story with the tabernacle. I mean, the tabernacle, which stands where the post office is now, had been an institution. I mean, this is where every community event was held. This is the, the space, right? And I mean, 
president, not presidents, but prophets, and well, yeah, presidents drove by Harding, and, and apostles and prophets and leaders of the church, funerals and celebrations were in this building, and to think about tearing it down was a big deal. And again, the Chamber of Commerce, and, 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 and that's a whole other story. But they chose a local guy, which was interesting because there were lots of other people that kind of competed for these contracts. And the design that they chose was, was he chose this Tudor style design. And what's interesting is this is before the Shakespeare Festival. This is before any of this idea of how Cedar City now kind of presents itself in some ways in this Elizabethan Tudor style town. And I kind of like to believe that, that Fred is looking at these things also as a way to move things forward. And it was really difficult. And people thought, this doesn't look like anything we have in the community currently. Right. Um, and, and I think it's very important. Interestingly, we just had in my Utah history class, which I, we just had this morning, the a discussion of Utah art, right? And one of the things we talked about was that, that early settlers of Utah wanted to civilize, to be civilized in the West, oh. right? They wanted to sh have art and drama. In fact, they, there are no hardwoods here, so they paint the furniture to look like the grain of wood. Oh. So you see early Mormon furniture and the grain is all painted, it's not natural, because they want to be seen as civilized, oh, yeah, you know, cosmopolitan yeah. type people. And so this is not that, right? right? This is not that look, this is not 1930s, you know, Art Deco type of things like the post office. It's completely different. So there's a lot of people who just say, I don't see it. I don't see it. But what really made the difference, and this is this really is applicable today, is that it was going to cost less. Oh. <laughs> right? It the, all the comes George, down to money. George Wood <laughs> says, listen, if we use these local materials, it's not, we'd like to think that this it's appeal to our better natures, but in reality, it's like, you're going to pay less money for this. Yeah. And so they did. And then, interestingly enough, it was dedicated by Heber J. Grant, but it had been completed years before, oh. not years, a couple years a couple before, years before, and services had been held in it, but it hadn't been paid off yet. Oh. And Heber J. Grant says, we will not worship in a mortgaged building. Oh. So I will not, we will not dedicate it as a true church until it is completely paid off. Wow. So, so the community works again, has another fundraiser uh, okay. to, to, to get it paid off. So Heber J. Grant will come down and now officially dedicate it as a, as a church. Wow. That is so, so I think it's interesting. Funny. And that's one of the things you think about as a historian that excites me a little bit is this idea that as you do oral histories and things, people's memories begin to become more positive of their past, uh, the older they get, uh, right? The closer you get to the end, the more, uh, in some ways, wonderful the beginning was and those kinds of things. And so it's important to, that's, I think, an exciting discovery yeah. of ours is to find that that people are people, whether it's 1830, 1930, or 2030, right? Right. We all share the same concerns, and, and I think that's a pretty critical thing. The secrets of Cedar City aren't the hidden, you know, we're not going to tell you where where certain people are buried because we know and we don't want to tell you that <laughs> or where the hidden treasure is. Right. But the secrets are the stories that haven't been told yet. And that's what we find and uncover. Well, that's it. So with this story in particular, um, you know, the, and we're, we're working on telling the story of the, the tabernacle and the, uh, the post office because ultimately what that came down to is there was an opportunity to get some much in needed cash from the federal government and they, to build a federal building. And so they said, well, we can build a post office. And that's where this came from. And it was Chamber said, where should we put it? And they had, again, there was a lot of community discussion. And it said, well, we, we want people on Main Street. You know, that's where we want people to go. And ultimately, they chose this space. Well, so when they chose that space, you know, as in the story, they committed to building a new chapel. Well. The thing that for me was most moving about this particular story is so we post it and, and we get some pretty good interaction online and, and you know, great story, you know, I'd love to see this, you know, I remember that as a kid or whatever. Well, we had on this particular story had somebody say, my dad helped build that. Oh. And so she shared her story about what she remembered about living in this particular area and about how that, that you know, they were paid and yet then they donated half their, was it half or was it a third? I forget, I forget. Yeah, it was the third. I think. Uh, of the money of their pay back oh. to the construction of, 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 the, of the building. Wow. But she shared her memory of what that was like as a kid yeah. to, to experience that. And for me, that's, again, that's those secrets that we have. Uh, I'm a huge Doctor Who fan. Oh. And uh, there, you know, there's a line that's, you know, we're all stories in the end. 
And the more I, the more research I do into the into the history here in our town, the more I see how true that really is. And you know, when when we're not around to tell our own stories, what are the stories that are told about us? Um, what becomes the legend of 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 us as an individual or the the collective good of the community? Yeah. You know, what what stories? Um, you know, continue to rise to the top. And like Ryan says, a lot of things are positive, but it's interesting as I get into some of this stuff, uh, I read and, you know, you read the, the newspaper stories and you find out, you know what, everything wasn't so rosy. Yeah. And, um, and so there, it lends context to some of the stories that we're able to tell. And I think the other thing that's exciting about the Rock Church is that these are the kids of the back up the mountain. Yeah. Right, so their their parents are the ones that that bring the school here. Right, that we're going to go back up the mountain and move forward. Stone so by this stone. was right. Yes. Yeah, these are the community. This was the community building project, Old Main, for for them to save the community. Right, and so these are the kids who who hear the stories from their dads and moms. This is what we did to build the build Old Main and bring the school here. Right. and this is our chance now to go back up the mountain and harvest the trees and get the rocks. And we can now share in this kind of collective excitement of of being, you know, going back again and and communally and communally building a similar type structure. Oh, I love that through line. That is so cool to think of them as kind of carrying on the mantle that they heard from their parents. And there was Rock Week. That's right. Rock Week, I love that. We should always celebrate Rock Week, I think. Mm -hmm. And then, and they were competing for the, the most interesting color and the most um, sort of vibrant one. Is that how it worked? Yeah, and so the, the, if you haven't had a chance, Take the opportunity to go over and check out the Rock Church. In fact, you can arrange for a tour. Um, but just spend some time looking at the craftsmanship in the building. Um, and it's, it's fascinating. And yeah, there is some pretty amazing rock, both inside and out. Ah. Um, so it's not just the exterior of the building. There's a lot of rock on the inside. Um, you know, they, uh, the rock in the baptismal font that they in there is, is spectacular. And, uh, and it shows the, you know, I, again, I read the story about the Rock Week proclamation, and you know, and it was June 12th through 15th or whatever it was, and, and it happened to be right around the time we released the story. And I was like, woohoo! You know, it's, it's serendipitous. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, and I can I can see just from the stories that I've read, you know, that it wasn't just oh well, you know, hey, that's a nice rock there, George. You know, it was no. I'm going to have the best stuff. I love that. And I do too. It's so cool. I never looked, I've, I've of course gone by so many times, but never looked really carefully to imagine, you know, them competing for the most colorful rock to put in there. I love that. Yeah. And this is what's exciting. This is what's exciting about the whole thing is that, <laughs> that you think really about this, <laughs> right? That, that we tear the tabernacle down, right? Here's the thing. Everyone wants to see a, a Mormon handcart or a pioneer wagon, but they're not there because you get here and you got to use that. Right. right, you're going to use it to build your house and everything else. We're not saving it like they did back then, like we did. So we're going to tear the tabernacle down because we want the post office and we need it. It, it, it served its purpose, right? It's the old battleship that we're going to sink. And the Rock Church is in the same position, right? I mean, it's a small building and these wards are getting bigger. But can you imagine anyone now saying, you know what we should do? We should tear down the Rock Church and build a, you know, a regular looking LDS church there. Right. It would be it would be uh, without our realm of possibility to think that would even happen. Yeah. And and it's so interesting how we've moved beyond that now, right? That yeah. we're going to now think about pr preserving that. I mean, I'm on the Historic Preservation Commission, and we're thinking about these buildings in a different way. Yeah. You know, we're we're caught in this di dichotomy of our our you our. our pioneer ancestors that, you know, you use it, you, you make do, and then you find something else to do it with this idea of, well, we have to preserve it, right? It's this conservation versus preservation idea that, that we're still fighting with more and more today. Our ancestors were like, yeah, it's too small. Yeah. Tear it down. Yeah. Build a new one. Yeah. Right. But now we have more history. Uh -huh. It's amazing. And even with that though, they, you know what, they saved the clock. They yeah. did. They oh, used the right. clock. right. That's they right. Did. Yeah. Well, Let's move on to our next one. You know, when we think of Cedar, we don't necessarily think of Hollywood in the movies. I mean, if we think of the movies in Utah, we tend to think more maybe Kanab. We know that some of the Westerns and all that kind of stuff. But I think we have a little connection to Hollywood. And that's kind of what our third video is about in the theater. So we'll get that up and running and show it. Since 1923, hundreds of thousands of people have journeyed to this area to immerse themselves in the scenic wonders at our doorstep. 
the mighty Union Pacific trains brought in visitors from across the world. And it was these same rails that ushered Hollywood into Utah. Due to the intensive marketing efforts of brothers Gronway and Chauncey Perry, in 1924, the Fox Film Corporation announced that the world's most popular cowboy, Tom Mix, would shoot his next film, Deadwood Coach, in the area. Not only would this be the first movie filmed locally, it would be the first one shot in Utah. Cedar City was now in the viewfinder of the Hollywood movie studios, and they fervently opened their community to them. Upon leaving Cedar City, Tom Mix prophesied, we have pioneered the picture production business in your section, much to our satisfaction and that of the director. And we feel that our reports on the possibilities of your country will induce many other companies to follow. And follow they did. Movies such as The Good Earth, Union Pacific, Drums Along the Mohawk, Brigham Young, Can't Help Singing, My Friend Flicka, and Proud Rebel were all filmed in Cedar City and the surrounding areas. The Gem Photo Play became the first theater in Cedar City. In 1919, Thomas A. Thorley built the Thorley Theater, replacing the Gem. Throughout the following decades, the Thorley would undergo a series of name changes, including the Avalon and the Utah, but by the 1950s, it would come to be known as the Cedar Theater. The Cedar Theater has become a local landmark and is directly tied to the personal histories of many in Cedar City as it became the site of firsts. First movies, first dates, and first kisses. It is the last of the traditional movie houses in the community as its sister theater, the Parks, formerly the Orpheum, was lost to a redevelopment project in the 1980s. Cedar City continues to serve as a gateway for intrepid explorers and casual travelers longing to discover that magic landscape Hollywood brought to the world. We invite you to discover what filmmakers have known since 1924. Roll the camera on your own adventure. The scene is set and waiting for you to call. Action! All right, so gateway to Hollywood here in our little town. Tell us more about that. So the railroad was a big a part of it, and, and a lot of these films were filmed closer than I tend to think of, Cedar. I tend to think of you know it being a little bit further away, but actually really close by. What can you tell us more? Go ahead. There we go. So yeah, the, yeah, the, go the, the, we cannot underestimate the train the, into Cedar City. I mean, it changes everything in 1923. Incidentally, 100 years. Coming up, 2023, so we need to do something. Let's do it. But, uh, but the train comes in and it changes everything. Because what it does is it allows us to take iron out, right, and then bring people in to see the iron rusting on the mountain. Ah, right. You know, the red, red rocks. Mm -hmm. So Iron County becomes one of the richest counties in the state of Utah for many years yes. because of the massive iron deposits that are still out there. And we're this massive hub of tourism with the Utah Parks Company and Union Pacific. And so once the train comes in, the, and Gronway and Chauncey Perry, these brothers who are critical to the, the development of this community, uh, have done all, have, have and a whole other, we can talk about that in a different time, figure out ways to get Hollywood here, right? Gronway has been, a, in World War I, he was race horses and was a big polo fan. Oh. And Will Rogers was a big polo fan, and they became friends, and so Chauncey was a pilot, and so they fly over and take pictures and say, listen, come here, and we'll, you know, don't shoot on the back lots, we'll give you horses and food and all kinds of stuff. So they begin to come. And so, like I say, Tom Mix is the first First, the first movie filmed in Utah is it's here. through Cedar City, right? Deadwood I didn't Coach. Know that. It doesn't exist. That film is gone. Oh. It is gone. The, the, the Fox Film Corporation burned down oh. and lost a ton of these old films. Mm. So it's gone. And what's interesting is, so the community, the chamber and others, get Tom Mix to commit to come to the Iron County Rodeo. <laughs> he, he, well, I can't remember his horse's name. Oh. Um, I don't, it's not, it'll come back. Anyway, anyway. so Tom Mix and his famous horse uh, are going to come. He's going to bring all his Hollywood cowboys, and they're going to compete with the local cowboys. And that's the big competition, right? No. And come this see. is huge. I mean, the, yeah. paper, the paper goes nuts I bet. to tell this story. Headlines, right? advertisements, Tom Mix, you know, all this stuff. Uh, but what happens is, is that the weather is so good that they film quickly. And so Tom Mix, the studio says, we're not gonna pay you to sit around Cedar City for four days <laughs> and to wait for the rodeo. You gotta come back to Hollywood. 
And so he writes this huge letter in the paper mm -hmm. that says, your place is going to be amazing, but to be honest with you, we never thought, we've never had a shoot that has went so well ah. with the weather. And so uh, I, I'm a man of my word. I signed a contract. When my boss says jump, I jump. Sorry. So Tom Mix never comes to the rodeo. Oh. So we never get to see how we would compete wow. against him. But after that, they, they just come in and film after film after film is, is here. And, and uh, Gronway and Chauncey, Canab, they move into Canab. And, but Cedar City is the gateway yeah. because this is where the train comes. The El Escalani Hotel, that's where John Wayne stays. We have stories of, of John Wayne going out in the back of the hotel playing baseball with the Cedar City kids. Uh. Um, Olivia de Havilland. All of these famous actors are here because this is how this is as far as you can get on train and then you have to go everywhere else and incidentally there's a picture in there of a movie crew and I'll tell you something uh, when I was working at Frontier Homestead I was trying to find more about the movie because all these some of these movies are you know yeah silent films yeah. and stuff and I, I found the actor that I thought the movie was and I typed it in and it was a porn star <laughs> So I, I had to go to my boss and say, hey, listen, this came up on my state computer. Oh, but no. So don't, if you're looking at that film, be careful who you Google. Yeah. Because uh, that's for. the case. But anyway, it just changes everything. The train changes everything. Hollywood changes everything. And for, you know, 20 years or so, big movies. My Friend Flicka, Drums yeah. Along the Mohawk, uh, Proud Rebel. Um, all of these films are can't help singing. The first color film with Deanna Durbin in it, which oh. means nothing to probably 98% of you, but it's it's fun and it's fun to watch Henry Fonda supposed to be in upstate New York, you know, running through the forest, and the next thing you know, he's on the edge of Cedar Bridge. Yeah. Uh. Well, and, and, and that, that uh, you know, Can't Help Singing is fantastic. I'd never seen the film and, until we did this project. And, and I thought, well, I'm going to have to check this out. And it's got some of the most spectacular video of Cedar Breaks. I mean, it's, it is stunning. And, you know, you got, and she's just singing her, singing her heart out. And then there's this amazing vista. And so, I mean, it's, it's uh, to see the fact that uh, we were inviting the world through through this particular thing was was pretty amazing so that's can't help singing if anybody wanted to find one you know i mean my friend flicka or can't help singing i think can't help singing is probably you can probably even see that on youtube yeah ah, uh, great. in um, fact that's how i check the union pacific is the huge a massive cecil b demille Yes. Production. Yes. Right? In 1939, same year as Gone with the Wind. Yes. Same year as Wizard of Oz. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. This is Cecil B. DeMille's big epic. Most of that is, well, not most of it. The outside shots are all filmed west of us. Wow. All of the, you know how they have like you and I and us in a train car, but then there's the film behind yeah. it. Uh -huh. All of that B-roll was shot in Cedar City. The big train wreck was in Cedar City. This wow. was the big, the big film. And it was a huge deal. That's so it was cool. a huge deal. Well, so if anybody's looking for something to watch this weekend and want to see a little bit of our town, that sounds great. It's not a recommendation to the film, by the way. It is a little bit long, <laughs> but it is a huge deal for the community. You can fast right? forward and watch. Yes, you can. <laughs> well, we have to talk about what's coming next so that we make sure. And just to remind everyone, if you want to see more, you can go on YouTube or Google Main Street Minutes um, and really find more because there's mm -hmm. nine episodes in season one. But what's going on next? What does the future hold for Main Street Minutes? So we've already got the teaser for the, uh, the Canaraville All Women Fire Department. That's going to be a fun story to tell. And so it's all it's an all female yeah. fire department. You, can take, you have to take a look what we got here on the Can't poster. Can't wait for that's that. It's going to be a good one. I'm, I'm excited for that particular one. And then uh, we're working on a five part series right now. We've actually begun production on a five part uh, series for the Utah Shakespeare Festival. Uh, talking a little bit about uh, again with that through line of community above self and how that plays out in the story of the Shakespeare Festival. Fantastic. So do you anticipate another full season of, or, I mean, how, or is it kind of ongoing work all the time for you? How? It's a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, so with, with, cause this, this, uh, the Shakespeare project is, is considerably larger than, you know, I mean, these are, you know, three minute pieces and the Shakespeare one is going to be longer. And, uh, so with that, that's going to eat up some of the time that we had kind of set aside for our official season two. And so we've, we've gone through and we, I mean, there are no shortage of stories to tell. Right. And that is the fascinating thing to me is the, the more, the more we dig, the more stories we discover, the more things we have to tell. And so we sat down and, and, uh, Ryan's office and went through uh, 32 or some uh, things that, and it wasn't hard to find that many stories. And so we've got a plan that, you know, we say, okay, here's our, 
nine or 13 or whatever we want to do for season two. And with the Shakespeare project, that's probably likely going to affect our, our overall number for what we end up producing. But it's the idea is for it to continue to be an ongoing series. Um, and as long as there's stories to tell, we're going to keep trying to tell them. And are you looking for stories? If anybody perhaps in the audience or watching might want to submit, is there a submission process or a suggestion process? We've never really talked about no, that. No, no, yeah, email me. Email yeah, us. That's right, Give yeah. us a call. Talk to us. I think that's what's what's critical. And what we've done is we've moved a little bit beyond Main Street, and we're also talking about events as well. So, for example, uh, part of Main Street burns. In fact, Cedar City almost completely burns down. In well, that's that's more of a, a right. little over dramatic, but <laughs> but it happened <laughs> in, 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 in the okay. '60s. So we're telling the story of the Main Street fire, oh, right, great. and and other things that, that are involved that way. We're we're moving. We've got a Parowan thing we're th mm -hmm. we're doing, and and Canaraville as well. Brian Head. We're telling the story of, of the ideally the ski uh, event. So we're we're moving in that way to tell more of these types of stories. And yes, we would love to do that. We still do Main Street tours, walking tours of Main Street as well. Oh, really? So, yeah. So I think it's it's about seeing how important Main Street was to our community and using that as a vehicle or a canvas, if you will, to, to speak about the broader issues of why these things are relevant. And even more importantly, why they're important to us today. And so what's the best way, should, should we find you through the Cedar City side or find you through SU? What's the best way if anybody would want to set up a walking tour or want to get in touch? Well, honestly, for me, it's through visitcedarcity.com. Visit, that's, uh, okay, visitcedarcity.com. Uh, yeah. We Paul can start there, and yeah, then, yeah, or, yeah, or yeah, you can know. find you on our SUU website, which is paul at suu.edu, I think, and all of that. So my parting comment for you, we have so many wonderful students in the audience. I always like to ask, what is your, you know, if you have one piece of advice for students, you know, from your, from your history or your perspective or um, just some advice that you would like to, you know, pass on, what would that advice be? Do you want me to go first? You, you're calling Go ahead. This is, my, this is my four. Read, watch, listen, and write. So always be reading something. Always be watching something. And I'm not saying like the birds and the feet. I mean, look at me. I'm not an outdoorsy guy necessarily. I love the national parks. I teach on the history of the national parks. But always be watching something, right, that, that, is, that is meaningful to you. Uh, Write something down. Write your story. If there's two, th if I've learned anything in my decades of teaching and, and doing history, it's that everybody has a story and everybody's story needs to be told. So write your story. And finally, listen to other people's stories. We're going into the best time to do that. Winter, Thanksgiving, Christmas. Spend the time listening to the stories of the people around you because you'll be fascinated by what you find. That's, fascinated. That's great advice. Wyatt, do you have any advice to add? I think for me, it's, uh, it's very similar to Ryan's, but it's uh, be willing to have an experience. Mm. And you know, you'll, I look at my time here at SUU and the experiences that I had there, um, here, not there, we're, we're here right now. <laughs> um, I look at those experiences. I look at the experiences I had through the work that I had done prior to working with the Tourism Bureau. And now I look at the experiences I have there, the experiences with my family that, you know, any place you go, you know, whether it's, hey, I just ran down to grab a coffee or whatever it is at the, at the coffee shop, there's an experience to be had and be willing to have one. Um, we're playing with this idea of taking a closer look at things. And I think that, that everyday events, uh, that's part of your story. And take a closer look at those things because you know what, They've, they might reveal something you didn't realize about yourself. I love that. Great advice from both of you. Thank you so much for your time today. Again, we will be on the radio at 3 p.m. continuing the story. Um, the show is Main Street Minutes, and you can find it on YouTube. We're going to hang around a little bit on stage if you have any questions for them or need to take a photo or want to read some of the panels. But thank you so much for your time. It has thank been you. an thank absolute you. pleasure. Thank you very Thanks. much. Thanks, everybody.